So let us look in the word of God, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me read from verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. That is, the physical Jesus is no longer in the earth. That's what he was saying. The, the Jesus, the flesh, he's not here. He died on the cross. He rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended up. He sits at the right hand of the Father and he is going to stay there until he comes again to take his church home. But Paul is saying, we now no longer know Christ in the flesh. And so what he's telling the people is, you have to look at him in a different way. Now God did an extraordinary thing in the life of the Apostle Paul. You see, men could say this. Well, it's all right for Jesus. He's the Son of God. He never sinned. He was pure. And Satan could find nothing in Jesus. It's all right for him to live on the earth and tell us to follow him. But how would it work for us? And so in his absolute spiritual genius, God raised up a man like the Apostle Paul. And what the Apostle Paul, well, what God did in the Apostle Paul was he showed in living color, if you want to put it that way, the the resurrection power of the crucified Christ. And so in Paul's life, there was revealed this life of Jesus that he talked about that's different. This revelation of Christ. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. And without saying it in the same context, the Apostle Paul could say, if you look at my life, if you be followers of me, you'll be a follower of Christ. If you do what I do, God will be with you. If you pray as I pray, God will hear you. He wasn't putting himself up as anything. But here God is showing the resurrection life of Christ in a mortal man. And that's what he wants to do with us. That's what we are here for. We're to manifest the savior of the knowledge of Christ in every place. Is it read, let's read on a little bit further. Verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, God doesn't have, didn't have to be reconciled to us. We had to be reconciled to him. God hadn't done anything wrong. God hadn't hurt us in any way. There's nothing that God did that he had to apologize for. The fault was entirely on our side. And so, as we know, he sent his son to die on the cross for us. And now we have been reconciled to God himself by Jesus Christ. As the brother was saying in the the, the veil of the temple is rent in twain. And not only did it give the, the way into the holy of holies, but it also took away the division between the Jew and the Gentile. There's one God, one Savior, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. We're all one before God. This wonderful thing that he's done. And he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, God has trusted us with the message that he's reconciled to the world. You know, I find as an evangelist, if you preach the gospel to people, they are very interested And often the most unlikely people will come to Christ. The difficulty with people, you know, we Christians, we say, well, the the people, they've rejected the Lord. No, they haven't rejected him. They haven't heard about him. How can you reject a savior you know nothing about? And so we have to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
But here, we, are, we have the ministry of reconciliation. Now, don't, I don't want to hear any Christian say, I don't have a ministry. Yes, you do. Your ministry is to tell people about the reconciliation that's in Jesus Christ. Every Christian should be a soul winner. Every Christian should be telling somebody else about Christ. If you don't have a plan in your heart, if you're not praying for some lost person, if you're not trying to get somebody else to heaven, I'm just telling you to your face, you are selfish and probably quite carnal. You're not thinking about others, you're only thinking about yourself. And that shows very little of the spirit of Jesus. He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that is witness that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. This reconciliation does not reckon our sin to us. You and I, as far as God is concerned, we couldn't pay for one sin. There's nothing we could do. We couldn't even pay the price, the proper price, for one sin. But God has reconciled. He doesn't impute any trespass unto them. Now, to us, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. I've been trying to to think about this, this verse because somehow it tugs at my heart as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God what is this verse telling us? it's telling us that Jesus cannot stand here in the flesh but we can It's telling us that in that sense Jesus cannot speak the way we speak to other people, but we can. And so what God does, he pleads with people, he beseeches people, he begs people to come to himself through us, through us. We are the ministers of reconciliation. We have the responsibility God, can you imagine that? He's not sending an angel. He's not making a fire. I haven't seen any burning bushes. I know other people might, but I've never seen a vision. But what I do have is I have a word from God. And God has said, I beg people through your life. I beg people, that's what Paul was telling the Corinthians, that we, he says, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Jesus cannot stand here and talk to you, but I can, he said. And I want you to be reconciled to God, for he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I don't think any of us understand that verse. I suppose it's fair to say that Christ took our sin and he, and he gave us his righteousness. Christ took our death and gave us his life. Christ took that place, if you like, in hell for us and he gives us heaven. Jesus died so we don't have to die. Remember that in the New Testament it never says a Christian dies. It always says they sleep because the sting of death is sin and Jesus has dealt with the the sinners, with the Christian's sin. That sin has been taken away. Sin is not an issue in in the valley of the shadow of death for the Christian, especially the Christian that keeps short accounts. But it may be it may be something that some of us need to think about because we should be keeping very short accounts with God very short accounts with God when Sarah Reginald came here uh, Theodore's wife she said to her family New Zealand is the uttermost part of the earth from Jerusalem 
this is just, you know, a mother talking. She said, New Zealand is closer to heaven than anywhere else. What a great place, she said, to go to heaven from. Well, isn't that a, a lovely thought? Now, what, what, what do we learn from that thought? Here's a woman who has heaven on her mind. Here's a woman who knows her mortality. Here's a woman that wants to go to heaven. Do you? Do you want to go to heaven? Because that's what happened there. How does that come about? It comes about because our sin has been dealt with. I said to Esther, you must write a book about your mother's prayer life. And I said, put it in a hard cover. Make it a hard cover book so people will read it and keep it and read it and read it again. Her prayer life. It's not my place to talk about it very much, I know little. But one of the things that struck me very deeply was that when she was speaking at the women's meeting here, uh, she said that it is wise to be a witness for Christ. And the way we witness for Christ is to live a righteous life. So that people, so that people will see your life and inquire about Christ. You know, I've never heard that phrase before. I've never had that concept put in front of me quite like that. And I think it's, mon- it's really wonderful, isn't it? To win souls to Christ, live a righteous life. Now, as I didn't pray at the beginning of my message, I'd like to pray now. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you again, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the word of reconciliation. We thank you for what Jesus has done for us, as we've been talking about. And yes, Lord, as we bow here, we pray for our brother. Lord, we commit all his life to you. And Heavenly Father, we pray here that you would give us some appreciation for your word like he had. And Lord, that you would help us to be like that family. We pray in Jesus' name for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be upon the remaining part. We ask you to help the speaker. Oh God, I pray for that anointing in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to turn with me, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 2, the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2, I did say that uh, there's one or two thoughts today, Uh, chapter 2 verse 1, thou therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. I have a great burden in my heart. I believe it's the burden of God that we should teach others. We should teach others. There's no doubt about it. There's a great need for, especially preachers, for example, to have people that they're teaching. Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples to pray. And there's a disciple, I was discussing this with the brother Theodore, I said to him, brother, you should have a a holy convocation and you should invite all of God's servants across India to the convocation and you should tell them that the entrance ticket at the door, you have to bring a disciple with you. If you don't bring a Timothy, you can't come to the convention. That's what you should do, brother, I told him. Because the burden is to teach others. Notice what, what Paul said. The things which you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. If you look carefully through 1st and 2nd Timothy, this is what you'll see, that Paul actually taught Timothy 64 different points, different things, 64 things he taught him in these two epistles. He was teaching all the time teaching the young man, teaching him how to serve God, teaching him what to do. 
I wonder if we are doing that. The things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same. Commit thou to faithful men. Lately I have been trying to say things in a way that people would want to repeat them. That's teaching, isn't it? If we say something to you, you might repeat it. We could say, for example, that God hates sin more than he hates the devil. Because it was sin that made the devil a devil. That's a saying, isn't it? We could say that. Now you repeat it somewhere else. Go and share it with someone else. Here's something else you could share that I just wrote in my notes today. He that falls into sin is a man. He that boasts of his sins, boasts of it, proud of it, he's a devil. He that weeps and mourns over his sin, he's a Christian. He that forgives sin is God. It's a good saying, isn't it? Write it in your heart and share it with other people. The things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. Are you and I faithful? I can tell you the truth. It's hard to find a faithful Christian today. It's hard. You know, the genius, I, I keep talking about Buck Singh. I went, I heard about him when I was a very young preacher, a man called Leonard Ravenhill, very internationally famous man. He, he, he came and he talked to me about this Buck Singh. And I inquired after him. This man who always knelt when he prayed, this man who would even ask the people in the congregation, he said, in America, he said, they were so shocked, some of them had never been on their knees in their life. And Buck Singh would stand there and wait till everybody was kneeling. And then he would pray. Now, we all went all different to him. But the thing was, I never did meet the man. But when he died, I, I went and spent some hours in his study and prayed. I went to his graveside. At that time, there was no monument on it. I had a hard time finding it. And a really dirty, disheveled man wearing a terrible clothes came over. And he was the caretaker. And he said, that's where it is. And I said, do you know whose grave it is? And I gave him some money. Now I said, I want you to, you, you, you dress different. This is Buck Singh's grave. It's a mighty man of God here. Now we know the assemblies have put a monument there or something. I carry his photo in my bag, my preaching bag. Why do we do these things? Because of the influence. That man taught me something. He taught me something. And what you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. His genius was, he loved God, and God brought around him men and women... Yes, women too. He used to take women sometimes in the teams and so on to different parts of India. I spoke to one of those old ladies and she was telling how they used to go and minister among the women. What a mighty thing to do. And he trained all these young men. And of course many of them became the great preachers they became because he gave them an opportunity. He taught them all the time. Faithful men. Who is a faithful man? Who's a faithful man? Who shall be able to teach others also? Now, as a Christian, are you teaching somebody something? If you're not, you're not faithful. You're not faithful to God. Faithful people teach others. They don't hold it to themselves. They don't hold it to themselves. They share it with other people. You see, that's the wonder of Jesus. He can't be hid. And when you love him, you want other people to love him too. I had the same shock. I had somebody in my home, I think yesterday or the day before, and they were telling me that they thought that all Christians were holy. 
when they got saved and they were so shocked when they found out what some of us are like but dear friends what you've heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men not just men and women who shall be able to teach others also there are two young men in the service today I brought them with me and they've only only been Christians a very very short time but I'm trying in my own way at least with one of them and the other one I've just sort of met to teach them what am I going to teach them first you've got to be right with God We're not going to put new icing on old cake. You've got to be right with God. Second, you must have daily communion with God. And I teach people that you haven't had a quiet time until you have been in God's presence. Until you've been in his presence. Remember what uh, Theodore said about his wife on the funeral day? He said... I would take the coffee to my wife in the morning and she would be praying and I would say, drink it while it's hot and she'd say, I'm not going to drink it until I've been in God's presence. And sometimes he said it went cold. That's a lovely memory now, isn't it? That's another thing you want to do, build memories. Build spiritual memories. Commit, teach them to love the word of God. Teach them to love the Word of God. Young brothers will ask me things. They keep asking me. I smile sometimes because I don't know the answer, but I don't tell them, and I go and find out the answer and come back and tell them and look all wise. But no. Teach one another. In the church, we need to be systematically teaching people the doctrines of the faith. I go to some churches and I preach, for example, on the Trinity and they don't know what I'm talking about. I tell them that Jesus Christ is God and I have young people arguing with me because they haven't been taught. This has to change. We look at the world and we say to ourselves, what on earth can we do? Everything's such a mess. What what can we do? We can keep serving the Lord and be faithful to him. Keep serving him. You may not be able, it's an old saying, not mine. You may not be able to light a bonfire, but you can carry a candle. And you can do it. You can help somebody else. You can be a disciple. I was intrigued. Before I came here, I was in a mighty rush, if you can imagine. But I got my concordance out just to check a point. And the point is, how many times in the New Testament is the word Christian mentioned, which is what we call ourselves? And how many times is the word disciple mentioned? Christian in the Bible, twice in the book of Acts and once in Peter, three times. Disciple. This is what Jesus t- t- said 276 times in the New Testament. We have put the emphasis in the wrong place. We're making Christians not disciples. A disciple is a follower. A disciple is somebody like John wrote, if you say you abide in him, you ought yourself also so to walk, even as he walked. Jesus said, he that hears you, hears me. Isn't that extraordinary? Luke ten sixteen. he that hears you, hears me. In other words, when you open your mouth and speak, do people hear Jesus? I was telling the young people the other night at the prayer meeting this book is God speaking to you God speaking to your heart and some of them are just young they don't know anything so I say now when you open it you say God will you speak to me in this book speak to my heart speak to my heart I was talking to a girl 
who spends sometimes hours reading the Bible. And do you know what? It didn't penetrate her heart. That poor thing, it didn't penetrate. She was doing it to please people. She was doing it to appear spiritual. She was doing it because people said she should. She was doing it actually to try and fight against sin, which she kept on doing, sinning I mean. Because the Bible can't keep you from sin. You've got to make Jesus in the word. He can keep you from sin. A verse of scripture, it has to be applied by faith. And if you apply it by faith, you're going to meet with God. The application of it comes from him. So are we teaching other people? Are we carefully teaching others? It's so important. The spirit of the Christian is the spirit of sharing. It's the spirit of giving. It's the spirit of love. And God has got something, but people are starving. People are starving. Ladies and gentlemen, it is fundamentally wrong. And some of you, you go, to, I know you, you go to churches where they don't even mention these things I'm saying to you ever. What's wrong? Why isn't this emphasis? I come across young people and they say, well, no, why, I don't, we don't know why we don't have a quiet time. And I say to them, does your pastor, does he get up in the pulpit and tell you to read the word? To pray? They said, no. Does he say, I, I saw something in my quiet time this morning? I want, no. And when you find a flock of God's sheep that do not read the word of God, it's because they've got a pastor that doesn't read the word of God. Or pray. We teach people what we are. Remember that God wants you to forget those things which are behind and reach forth to those things which are before, I'm speaking from Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul said, This one thing I do, the 13th verse, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Are you and I living for the high calling of God? Are we pressing toward the mark? You know, most Christians think that the Christian life is a life of endings. No, it's not. It's a life of beginnings. It's a life of beginnings. It's not a life of emptiness. It's a life of fullness. Remember, before you got hold of Christ, Christ got hold of you. Before you went near him, he called you. Before you confessed your sin, he had died for your sin. Before you came to him and said, I want you to be a child of God, he could say to you, I've been waiting for so long. So remember that. Forget the thing. Stop. You, most, you know what many of us are doing? We are living. We are living in the past. We're hanging on to something in the past. I can tell you people that would not come to this assembly because somebody here has offended them. God pity you. I thought you came here to meet with Jesus. And you let some little weasel stop you from getting close to Jesus? How wrong is that? But that's, you see, that's the petty place we live. Where our lives are so small. I often say to people that if there's a hypocrite between you and God, remember, the hypocrite is closer to God than you are. Jesus said, I know my sheep, they hear my voice, and they follow me. We're not called by God to follow an assembly. Buck Singh never, ever asked anybody to follow him. Never. But he did ask them in their thousands to follow Christ, and they did. Forget those things which are behind. Back there, someone hurt you. Leave it with God. Back there, there's something you can't repair. Stop trying to repair it. Bring your heart to God. And say, Lord, I've wasted so many years on this thing. I'm being ridiculous. So you know what? Sometimes people hurt us. Those people are dead. 
You hear me? They died. They had a funeral for them. And we don't even know they're dead and they're still hurting us. Stop it. Forget the things which are behind. Reach forth to the things which are before. Stretch your hands out. Stretch your hands out. What's in front of us? God is in front of us. What's in front of us? The Word. What's in front of us? Service for God. Service for God. You can serve God anywhere. I press toward the mark. I just mentioned that pressing. Pressing, going forward determinately. Someone spoke the other night about the woman with the issue of blood. And she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. Now remember, that woman was weak because doctors had worked on her body and it didn't work. She, had been, she was tired. And in front of her, all these people's backs. So what did she do? She just purposed in her heart, I'm going to touch his garment. She wasn't trying to talk to him. Wasn't trying to do anything, just touch his garment. And You know, there's such a determination. I love that woman. She's so determined. Imagine those hot backs in front of her, that dusty road, people calling out, people pressing. They were so close that the disciples said, when Jesus said, who touched me? They said, Lord, there's a lot of people here. What do you mean, who touched me? Somebody touched him in faith. Faith. Lord, increase my faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I press toward the mark for the prize. I've already talked about the prize. What are you living for? As Theodore Reginald sees his wife die, And as his children now see him quite ill, let me ask you a simple question. What do you think that man is trying to hang on to? What's he trying to hang on? He's not trying to hang on to anything. Everything they did, they they, they planted the seed. Look at those children. Look at those, they're all men and women of prayer. They all know a lot about prayer, more than I do. They've been taught by a godly mother and a godly father. And they're not afraid to pray. Hannah told me, she said to me, my father used to make us read 15 chapters of the Bible every day. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I feel like saying, hands up those who have read 15 chapters of the Bible any day in your life every day she said my father would not allow us to listen to the radio or watch television or anything like that he would not allow us to do homework on a Sunday we were only allowed to read religious books read the Bible and pray that's all we were allowed to do on a Sunday and then she said to me That's why we know so much about these people you talk about, that I talk about. These godly men and women of the past. She's read, they've read the books. They didn't fail any exams. Are they godly people or are they not? You see the point that I'm making? Press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. Some parents, they push their children so hard... They, to be getting their exams and doing all these things and they become proficient in the ways of the world. They become proficient at getting money and they are spiritual midgets. They're spiritual. Oh, the boy can pray. He can pray because he can repeat his father's prayer that he heard his father pray so many times. But he doesn't have any prayer of his own. And young people, I talk to them, you know what? They believe that God is keeping them because of their parents' prayers and their rights. But it's only half right. 
It's only half right. Because the day will come then when what they are is going to be tried and it's going to be tested and mum and dad are not going to be there. They're not going to get the result of this exam. And then they're going to say, oh, what about when a man comes to you? Something's happened to his child and he knows the child is dying. And he says, Pastor, would you please pray for my boy? What's wrong with that man? I'll tell you what's wrong with him. He can't pray. He didn't pray with his boy. He never went, he never went near the place of prayer. But now he realizes he needs God. And he doesn't know God. He doesn't know how to talk to him. He doesn't know how to cry out to him. The salesman came to my house one day. i never seen him before. But just as he closed his folder, I said to him, I'm a man of prayer. Uh, I would like to pray for you. Oh, oh, he said. Man about 28 years old. He put his head down and I prayed for him. And when he put his head up, he was had tears. And he said to me, I've never heard anybody pray since I was a little boy and my grandfather took me to church one day. Friends, that's sad, isn't it? We are ambassadors for Christ. What we've learned, what we've been taught, we must teach others. And we must forget the thing. Let's stop burying old bones. Let's stop scraping up old stories. And let's press toward the mark for the prize. You and I know that as far as we know, this was Paul's last epistle that he wrote. Soon he used to have his head chopped off. And if you asked Paul what he would do that day, he would say, I'm going to pray my prayers the way I always do. And I'm going to witness to the God. That's what I'm going to do. And that's the way we must live too. Well, the Lord bless you. And the Lord bless your home. And the Lord bless your prayer life. And the Lord be close to you. And in your churches, may you be such a godly person that people will say, you've got something that we need. What, tell us about it. Teach others. You go to a woman's group, don't let them keep telling you nothing. Share with them. Don't just go and play golf with the men. Invite them to your home for prayer. Do these things that are godly. God will bless you. And don't assume that your young people know the Lord just because they give you all their right answers. No. What have they been taught by you? If your son is not reading his Bible... If your son is not saying to you, Dad, I want you to pray for my friend at school. Dad, I want you to pray for so-and-so. I'm trying to witness to him. There's something wrong in your home. If your daughter just wants to play with her friends. You know, there's a little girl. Oh, she's not here. I'm glad. Her mum and dad are here. She's only about seven or eight years old. And she's got a little friend next door. A little heathen girl, I guess. Parents don't go to church, don't do nothing. And she made friends with this little girl, and she started trying to pray with her. And then the little girl started telling her lies, and she told her, you can't lie. God doesn't like lies. She's been here a few times, that girl. What is she doing? Well, the little girl, Gabriella, she's just being herself. She's just being herself. She prays every night. She reads. She prays. She comes to the prayer meeting sometimes and she prays a better prayer than, than some of us do. Not, not that prayers are good. But you understand me. Now she's just being herself. What, what are your, what's your self? What is your children's self? What are they? Look at your heart. Look at your home. See what God is doing. Get hold of truth.
Get hold of truth. I know I'm going to stop, but there's a man sitting back there, my friend from Tokoroa. I met him in my house. There was, and I was taking the funeral and stuff. And he was there. He wasn't a Christian. And for several days he was there, and I didn't know him really. About a week after the funeral, him and his wife came to see me. And they said, we want, we've come to see you uh, because we want you, to, we want you to introduce us to Jesus Christ. That's what they said to me. And we've been friends for years. And recently his wife died, and I went down to Tokoroa and preached at her funeral. And I preached at the graveside. And their son, I don't know, maybe 42 years old, four or five children, I felt in my heart, and I saw there was a lot of people there, and I felt that God had spoken to this man, and I didn't say anything. But he had to go back to Australia, and he said to his father, would you take me to see uh, Barry on the way home? He came to my house, and we sat down, and I told him about Jesus. And I told him what the Lord could do for him. And I just simply spoke to him as simply as I could. And he received Christ as his Savior. He didn't pray very much. And then I said to him, if I gave you something, what would you say? He said, I'd say, thank you. And I said, well, has God done something for you? Oh, yes, he has. Well, I said, why don't you thank him? And then he really prayed. You should have heard him. He poured out his heart to the Lord. His father got in touch with him the other day and he said, I'm reading my Bible. I don't, they've got no church. I'm reading my Bible. Why is he reading his Bible? Because he was told to read it. We must tell people. We must teach them. What God has given to us, we must teach to others also. And so I just end this, uh, uh, this three-part message uh, right there you're a minister of reconciliation and what God has taught you you must teach somebody else and you must forget the things which are behind and press towards the things which are before God bless you